particular motion, you know, that's open at the beginning with a big boulder in the middle. Good. Uh, do you know what I'm going to do now? Right, I've, I've actually done this lecture. Um, this is the fifth time I've done it this week. I would have done it on Wednesday, but uh, for certain reasons I didn't. Um, and um, so we're going to look at Rapa Nui, which is Easter Island. And I'm going to I'm going to do something slightly experimental today. I'm going to forget everything that we've um, everything that we've done this week. Um, and, and see if well, I can approach them all from a different angle, which would be rather interesting. So I go, I go, rip up my notes in front of me, and let's let's start from where we were. So uh, it's known as Rapa Nui to the local people, Easter Island. It's the most isolated piece of permanently inhabited land on the planet. There are other rocks out there, but this is a land, a uh, small land mass of 66 square miles that has been occupied for a very long time. Now, if you, if you go to one historian, one historian will tell you that there have been people on Easter Island for a thousand years. Other historians will say that there have been people on Easter Island who have been there for 2000 years. Others will say that they've been on Easter Island for a lot longer than that. Other people would say that people have only been on Easter Island for 800 years. So I'm, I'm one of those that be, believes that we, that people have been on Easter Island for about 2,000 years. One thing that we always think about when we examine Easter Island is the statues. And the statues themselves are the epitome of Easter Island. And then it takes us down a rabbit um, hole. And the rabbit hole is as follows. Um, if you look at Von Daniken and Charak Sophia, Von Daniken will say that the statues could have only been placed on the island by um, aliens or another race. Um, and up until the 1960s, mostly on the island of Rapa Nui, what we would see is just the top parts of the statues. But if Ronald Daniken would have realised that these statues, lots of them are in excess of 10 metres tall and not just the heads, maybe you'd have thought that these people had been, um, these statues had been carved by beings from a, not, not just another solar system, but from another universe. But that's been very disrespectful of the people on the island. One of the things that I've chosen to ignore today is who these people are, i.e. did they come from Polynesia? Did they come from um, South America? Did they come from somewhere else? And the reason why we're going to ignore that question is it's quite clear. Whoever, whoever constructed the statues on Easter Island, whoever kept the civilization of Easter Island going, um, they are still humans and they still um, created great feats of engineering and great feats of civilization. So going to the idea that people have been on Easter Island for um, 2000 years and didn't arrive from Polynesia um, only 800 years ago, um, assists me to understand the small numbers of people who originally got to Easter Island um, and then they um, developed into a culture over a few hundred years, then leading into the period, their golden age, where they are erecting um, these wonderful um, monuments. Now, the one great thing about doing a, a lecture series like this in the week is that you get so many questions. So I've, I've, I've got to remember that, I, that I'm not going to look at the stuff in front of me. Um, but one of, the, one of the great questions um, was, as follows, um, are there actually female uh, representations in the carved stone figures? And the answer is yes. In the 1950s, they did discover um, female versions of the supposed male figures that dominate um, Rapa Nui, Easter Island. We have over a thousand carved statues on Easter Island which are visible. Many may, may uh, lie under the months that have been created as a cause of effect of the removal of the trees on Easter Island. But the removal of the trees on Easter Island, the decimation of um, Easter Island, the climatic collapse of Easter Island was not, was not um, totally the fault of the uh, people of Rapa Nui. It was actually the fault of Westerners going to the island. Up until the late 1700s, Westerners um, on Rapa Nui, um, as they got to Rapa Nui, decimated what was left of the trees, the flora, the fauna, um, everything that was associated with the civilization. And within a hundred years of contact with the Western world, um, the Easter Islanders, the Rapa Nuians, as a civilization collapsed. 
they hadn't collapsed at the point of time that Westerners got there. This, this island it's, itself is extremely remote and what we usually associate with this island are the statues and not the settlements of the people constructed by the nata, native Rapa Nuians. Rapa Nui basically means big rapper because there's not a rapper, there's little islands um, but those are uninhabited, little islands off the coast, um, not even the size of the likes of the island of Flatome and the Bristol Channel. The one thing that we have to say is that if you open a book, it will immediately say that this is a Stone Age culture. It will immediately say that this is a prehistoric culture. The problem is they actually had writing. They not only had a language, they not only had a sense of communication, which we'd appreciate at this time in the history, but they also had a written form of writing. And as you know, Jessica, the definition of prehistory is before writing. The definition of history is mm. um, um, are, uh, is at the point that writing has been discovered. These people had writing, so it cannot be said that they are in a prehistoric period. Just to wind Bill up, they carved these statues without iron tools. But then again, Bill, this is not granite. This is quite soft. This is a volcanic tufa, so it's quite easy to carve, Bill. Using um, obsidian axes, which we've got lots of evidence of, which are associated with volcanic activity. This is a volcanic island. Now, looking at this illustration, uh, this map, um, tells you a few interesting things. So what we're going to do, we're going to do a bit of annotation. Um, if we go with that there, if you get an idea of scale, that's five miles. So you can say five miles, you can say 10 miles, 15 miles, no more than 20 miles across. So this is, this is, this is not a, a massively long island, uh, but it would have taken you a good day to go from one end to the next. Um, what you do see on the island is lots of um, volcanoes, um, and these are dormant or now extinct. This is where we need to look at Orango, and this is also where we need to look at um, the wonderful site of the Great Quarry, associated with the quarry in for most of the statues on the island. Now, um, Anne will no doubt have seen this book that I'm actually going to show you. This is a first edition um, of a book entitled Contiki. This book itself is entitled, entitled Contiki and I. This is written, um, this is um, written in association with Eric Hesselberg um, and an explorer that we will all be aware of, a certain man by the name of Thor Heyerdahl. This was his expedition, his expedition of understanding, his expedition of trying to understand if you could get from mainland Chile to some of these um, outward islands like Easter Island. It's best not to call it Easter Island. It was so-called Easter Island um, down to about, um, and, and um, Jessica, am I sounding loud and clear? Um, you sound clear to me. I'm but not Anne sure about everyone else. Your sound is still a bit fuzzy. Anne, if my sound is a bit fuzzy, it's you. Do you know, I love passing the blame. You know what I mean? You, you, you <laughs> set a light to house with your own matches and you can blame somebody else for it. It's great. Um, so... And by the way, Anne, right, um, it's probably your washing machine on in the background. Oh, hang on a minute. Somebody else has written a, written a message. I just put my hearing aid in. <laughs> you, you can't make that up, can you? Do you know, I, I, am, I am completely off on another tangent. Do you know, I need to stop reading those messages. Right, Easter Island. The reason why it's called Easter Island and not the native Rapa Nui um, is that in 1722, a Dutch navigator known as Jacob Rogoven um, visited Easter Island, the first Westerner to ever visit it. And the island would not be visited for another 50 years. Um, it's, it's very much thought now that um, not only was an island still in its throes of culture, it was still erecting statues. They still had the Birdman festival that they'd have every single year. 
This was an island still going places. This wasn't an island of arrogant, ignorant savages running around uh, the place. This was an um, island still of trees, which is a rather interesting thing. Jessica, you know, you know what's sometimes good? Admitting that you're wrong. If I was doing this lecture five years ago, I would say that um, the civilization on Easter Island was, was wiped out well before um, Westerners got there. And secondly, because the Easter Islanders have cut down all their trees. Both of those are, um, have turned out to be complete lies. And you know what? Um, I was doing research on this on Monday, and guess what pops up on the computer? A news article about the latest research done on Easter Island published on Monday. <laughs> Can't get any more up to date than that, do you know what I mean? But every, everything, uh, most of what this little news article says is basically what, what I'm saying now, you know, which is great. Um, so, um, you know, but by, by 1774, Captain Cook is writing something very different about the island because four years earlier in 1770, the Spanish arrived and so did the Dutch in numbers. And basically the civilization on Easter Island started to collapse from that moment. It didn't collapse from before. It wasn't the Rapa Nuians who cut down all their trees. It was us. So, you know, th these are all really, really important points. So what, what, we, what we are finding is, is um, there were archaeological excavations here in the late 1800s by an American archaeologist who basically removed lots of the um, huts and uh, buildings of the native peoples, put them on board ships and sent them to America, indicating that these people were naked savages running around that didn't have any houses, one. Um, and secondly, much of the portable archaeology was removed and sold and taken to New Zealand in America as well. So when archaeologists look at Easter Island, they think, well, load a bunch of ignorant savages. But they definitely weren't that. This was a high culture. But the biggest question is, how did people actually get to Easter Island in the first place? Now, this, this, is, quite, this is quite an important issue. Now, um, whether they came from Polynesia or whether they came from South America, we're not talking about that one. But if they are coming from South America, they would, would have had to have traveled 2,500 miles. Well, actually 100 miles under that, um, which is a long distance. Or if they w um, went from some other Polynesian islands, same distance, these people jumped on board boats and not knowing where they're going. Now, the, these, these are really all important issues. Now, um, the question is this. What makes somebody leave their home into the ocean, not knowing where they're going, having to travel for up to 50 days to find a landmass? On board that vessel, you'd have had to take family, uh, your wife, your children, other people in the community. You'd have had to have taken uh, drinking water, food to eat. If you go into colonize somewhere, somewhere, you'd have had to take your chickens, your rats, um, pigs and dogs. If you're in North America, you'd have taken turkeys with you. You, if um, you'd have had to, you would have needed to take them bananas, sweet potatoes, taro, bread, fruit, depending on where you were coming from, all these different sort of places. Um, with all that on board your vessel, um, you would have had to have survived for that length of, t length of time. Um, and there's one interesting thing that we do know about uh, Easter Island. Whenever people got to Easter Island, or from wherever people got to Easter Island, they went there in one moment. What we're saying is that um, if you want to do the analogy, um, what's the best analogy? Okay, then human beings go to the moon. The Americans, that's it. There was one event that, we, that we've been to the moon. And from that one single event, the Americans need to colonize the moon from that one rocket, right? So obviously um, they've taken women with them and they've got the food and stuff. But that is the only time we've been to the moon, and, and from that moment onwards, everything spurs onwards. What we're talking about is there was one event in history that they got to Easter Island, and the archaeological evidence tells us that. They don't say that people have been to Easter Island um, 100 years AD, and then there's another wave 200 years AD, because the cultural evidence from 200 years AD would be different from 100 years AD. 500 years AD would be different from 100 years AD if you had seen waves of people. Differences in people, differences in technology. So what happened with Easter Island, they were isolated and they evolved from that moment. Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, job done. This is what we're talking about. 
I don't know if that's the, a comp the best analogy I can come up with, but it certainly tells us why, why a small group of people then expanded over a thousand years and then to actually start carving these statues and to actually start building them. So in other words, it's the idea of um, determinism. We determine what we're doing. Let's determine our relationship, right? So um, our relationship is to get married, have children, um, get jobs, um, car, whatever, and then grow old and die, right? Um, in that, there aren't other people coming in to, um, you know, and so on and so on and it's just that, that analogy that you're going in one direction that's determinism um, from one point it's not that sense of diffusionism diffusionism works where you get constant waves from egypt or you get constant waves from um, america or you get um, constant waves and they keep influencing you the, um, the diffusionist way let's diffuse the information let's diffuse the coffee and that sort of thing so it's likely it was just one wave of people who got there. There may have been, they may have been occasional wreck of a ship, a, a boat on their shore over that period. But the main influence is from that small group of people. Um, this is what we're seeing. How, how these um, two dozen people on board a boat that must have been the size of Noah's Ark to carry all the supplies on, um, um, how they managed to um, evolve into 10,000 to 20,000 people within 1,400, 1,300 years. I don't know. Like, there's so many questions. But what we've got to do is talk about the realities of these people and, and their, their movement in civilization. So um, I've been using all this, I've been using this all this week. And I've suddenly started to realize that this is actually somebody who's done a mock up in a little model on their desk. But anyway, um, when, when we did this talk today, we actually had somebody who'd actually been to Easter Island. Um, and uh, with all due respect, Jessica, you haven't been there, nor have I. So, um, so we're going to look at that site, the Rango, and we're going to look at um, these two little islands here. And there's a big crater here as well. And what we do have is we've got um, this Rano Maraku. Now, these are really two important locations on the island. And one one thing that was basically thought, um, was asked in the week, was did um, these people on Easter Island occupy the um, inland areas, like these mountain ranges and stuff? Um, up until this morning, up until the end of the lecture this morning, I would have said it's likely, but we don't have the evidence. And then actually somebody reached out and they said, actually, um, what the most recent research is, is that people lived in this um people lived beyond this coastal zone and um there was agriculture way into the interior um or people um lived and um you know between the trees and all these other things and along the coastal margins a fine coastal margin uh, this little coastal margin they erected these statues which actually makes um some sense with what we're seeing but not all of this actually makes perfect sense so there's the isolation of Easter Island. So if we, if we want to sort of um, look at the Easter Island, that you know, there's the, um, there's the sort of closest uh, Pacific Islands, there's sort of North Amer uh, South America, North America, the other islands up to the north. So, so whatever's actually go going to you, uh, it, it would need a substantial, it would need a substantial um, effort to get there. Uh, people are just jumping in the ship and just going there. In other words, it's like pointing up into the sky and suddenly landing on, on the moon. This is what we're talking about. It's potluck that we land on the moon. You could keep going, but you're going to end up dying because you're going to run out of supplies. This is what we're talking about. I, yeah, it's the thing. If you, um, if, if you had a, a hundred rockets on this planet and they all went up into the sky, at least one would land on the moon. That's what we're talking about. One group of people eventually got to Easter Island and when it, whatever happened to everybody else was... Uh, was was nobody's business. Lots of what we do know about the island is that at one point the island was completely commanded in trees. There were trees absolutely everywhere. So you can get to Easter Island today. Um, so these statues, 
on the island there are, there's over a thousand statues that we know of there are probably quite a large number buried in the ground uh, by all the landslides uh, associated hello? with hello sorry you you literally went froze them for a second but uh, can you still hear me yeah now i can all right okay uh, michelle any chance of a drink please Thank you. coffee please coffee? yeah Right. So, um, one thing uh, in your in your learned thought, Jessica, do these statues look as if they've been standing for three, four hundred years? Yes or no? Did you get that? No, you you froze again. Right. Okay. Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put the um, I'm going to put the ancillary thing in. So if you can bear with me a minute, I don't know if everyone yeah. else is getting this broken up. Bear with me. Do you know, could it, could it actually be your end that's um, doing that Johnny Depp? Because um, you're, you're frozen, but everyone else is moving. Does that make sense? I think you're too far from the Wi-Fi. No, I'm not. Who, me or Carl? Um, um, you're freezing. Lost you again. I think you're too far from the Wi-Fi. I'm not, I'm not too far from the Wi-Fi because I'm plugged directly into it now. So there you go. Right, so um, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Right. What, when, when, it, when it goes a bit thingy again, just say, okay? Yeah, no, that's fine. Don't, don't just put the thing on the line because I can see it flashing. But the question I asked earlier on was, do these look like they have been there for, you know, 300 years, 400 years? Do they, uh, what's the answer? Um, I would say that they look, you know, they look like they've been there for a while, but, um, uh, go on. I think the, it, the, the only thing that fascinates me is the, um, the fact that, you know, how would they have done it so long ago? You know, something so big like that made out of stone. Well, well, I did. Um, it's quite soft stone. It's too, it's volcanic stone. Like the, the, the point I'm make, making is that, um, what happened is that some of these statues, when when the archaeologists started looking at the island, were actually lying flat, right? And when they found them lying flat, um, they showed no signs that they had been deliberately ripped down. Uh, the other point as well is, is that they've reconstructed, they've actually put them back up on their plinths. And the um, local Rapa Nguyen's have actually said, how dare you do that? Yeah, they're, they're down on the ground for a reason. Why do you do that? And the archaeologists and historians and conservatives are saying, oh, we need to put them up because they may have fallen because of an earthquake, or they may have been pulled down by a Christian missionary, or you guys may have pulled them down. And they're up and you into saying, well, hang on a minute, maybe they hadn't have been erected in the first place. Oh, right, okay, oh, we'll put them up anyway. So in other words, what the problem is, when you're looking at a landscape like this, the context is lost. You know, we, don't, we don't know what this actually was meant to look like. They've all put them facing out, either inland or out to sea. Um, and, and the problem is with Rapa Nui is that lots of the archaeology has been messed around with. So again, give you an idea of um, where we exactly are. And then this. Now, what we do know from pollen analysis is that East, Easter Island Rapa Nui um, was once dominated by um, a species of great palm tree. It had its own tropical rainforest, or its own rainforest, uh, more likely. And these great palms supported a massive diversity of life, trees, flora and fauna, small mammals, um, various birds, various index, in insects, spiders, and so on and so on. And what, what we do feel 
um, what we used to say is all these trees were pulled down to, to move the stones. And then we start to realize that the stones weren't moved by the wood. Um, we, 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 now, we now understand that the stones were actually walked along. And amazingly enough, um, 10 meter tall sort of bodies were actually moved across the landscape by walking them. This is, this is the evidence that we now have. Um, and they've experimented to say it's done. Um, the, if you compare this with something like Stonehenge, the, the stones, um, we don't really know how the stones were moved um, to where they are at places like Avery or Stonehenge. But we've demonstrated um, that these, these sort of great obelisks can be moved across the landscape uh, using a series of ropes and pulleys. Why did, why did they need to cut down the trees? They actually needed to cut down the trees to move the stones. Not for the timber to move the stones, but because the trees were in the way, which is a big difference. And obviously with that, you would have been able to use the timber anyway. So it was quite, quite likely that there were many trees still growing on Rapa Nui by the time the likes of Christopher Columbus got, not Christopher Columbus, um, the legs of Captain Cook got there in 1774. Now these, these are rather interesting because these little things on the top are actually called the top knots, um, which are the red scoria, which, which represent um, the native hairstyle. Now we're looking at these and you can actually start to notice that um, the features are rather different on these statues um, and their representations. And, and oddly enough, they, they only started to realize that in the, um, 19, in the 1950s that there were female representations because the female's anatomy and the female's body parts were actually buried below the ground surface, not deliberately buried, but, but due to various landslides associated with the de-wooderstation um, of the island very much after all the statues had been created. It's said as well that some statues were being still erected, uh, um, not only at the time uh, that, um, not only the time of Captain Cook getting there, but some of the statues being erected after that as well. So this is a nice little reconstruction. They're, they're sort of showing that some of the statues would have looked. Carl, like you've gone again. Right. What I'm going to do, I'm going to bring somebody else on just to sort of test this out. Um, one second. Um, if Can I, hear if you I again now. Your, right, I need to see if it's your side or somewhere else. We, we it's it's saying them here that your um, network band is low on the screen. Okay. Now you've gone. Okay. Uh, Pat, I'm unmuting you. How am I sounding today? Well, kind of like you're close to the microphone, you know, and uh, it just sounds... Um, loud yeah and close sort of that's what made the fuzzy sound right so what about if we if we take this down a notch is that working no yeah that's working about the same it? but it's yeah it's not quite so fuzzy okay 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 i don't know what's happening today um so obviously we've got these representations and obviously back to the palms and this is what the island may have looked like back in the past. And you can imagine a group of people getting to the island thinking, well, we can use this for building material, we can use this for roofing material, uh, we can use the, the raw timber itself um, um, for, um, uh, for canoes and so on. Now, what is good is that when you get little articles that you can actually find, and they actually completely agree, um, with with the with your lecture so you've got easter islanders native civilization was only destroyed after european colonizers reached the isolated nation in 1770 and brought with them disease slavery and murder a long-held theory claims the native society um collapsed around 1600 but we now know that that's not true because it was still flourishing into the late 1700s and early 1800s european settlers arrived on the island it was flourishing with lots of descriptions. It only started to collapse when lots of people were dying from disease, murder, and slavery. 
um, we're told of a little trick that was used in the um, in the eighteen in the late eighteen fifties. Um, a group a group from Chile went over to Easter Island, and they basically said, "Oh, um, do you all want to leave Easter Island for a new life?" And hundreds of people said, "Yeah, that that sounds like a good idea." Do you want to work on our plantations? And they said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. This is the Rapa Nui saying this. That sounds like a great idea. Anyway, they got on board the boat, and as soon as they got on board the boat, they were placed into irons, and they immediately become slaves. So this is the, this is the type of thing that's happening. So the epitome of, of Rapa Nui is these faces. You know, you'd see these heads looking out at you. They are all different. And, and again, this, the general thinking has been that society, um, that the society that Europeans saw when they first showed up was one that had collapsed. Our conclusion is that monument building and investment were still important parts of their lives when these visitors arrived. And again, that idea of another archaeologist saying that Polynesian seafarers got there in the 1200s. But as I've said, the problem is with the Polynesian seafarer theory arriving there 800 years ago is that um, they arrived and they started um, carving the Can't statues straight away. Oh. Um, yeah? What's wrong? Nobody can hear me. Hello? Hello? <laughs> Has he not paid his electricity bill? <laughs> no, I'm here. Um, obviously, this this really new computer I've got is absolute crap. Uh, this 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 has happened twice this week now. And uh, the moral of the story is, don't Carl, buy expensive Carl. computers. Anyway, Carl, let's carry. Take... On. What's that? Carl. Carl, yes. you take your. Can't you take your earphones off and just? Talk directly into the computer. Uh, no, because because I've invested in a new computer that doesn't have a, a microphone or it doesn't have any listening things. Oh. All the money's gone into the technology. Oh. So uh, that that that's been a bit of a mistake. So I I, t I tell you what, I'll go over to the new computer. Hang on, the old computer. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a nightmare, any new technology. I mean, it's bad enough trying to get broadband to your house. <laughs> that was a waste of money, Michelle. Are you seeing me now? I can see. I can see the top of your head, Carl. Right. Is, is that clearer? Uh, the picture is not great, but you, you, we can see. I can see everything. Right. Okay. That, 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 right. Okay. For a tea break, I think. Oh right, yeah, it's probably probably about the right time to have a tea break, actually. Right, you 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 save up to bloody buy something, right? And it's absolute <laughs> shite. You're freezing again. It it stalls on you. Oh great. 
Oh, there's a very handsome man there. Not me. Yeah. <laughs> what? So, so there, so there should be. Oh my God! You're not get. Yeah. Okay, we'll take a break. Okay. One thing you could do for me while everyone's gone. I'm having trouble getting your last notes. The server, for some reason, is rejecting them. I don't know when you got time. No, no rush yeah. today. But if you could resend it. Yeah, I tell you, I'll resend it now. <laughs> right. Okay. So if we. Do you know what? Right, we're we're into the second half. Hopefully, nobody's going to interfere with me. Okay. Um, oh. Fine would be a chance. Uh, I better do this would then. Be a fine thing. Yeah. I, I didn't even ask you, Henry. So what what we were looking at the before I was disturbed before the break, right? The general thinking used to be that um, as the Europeans arrived on Rapa Nui, the Rapa Nuiin civilization had already collapsed. Now, this is where we were before the break, even though you've probably missed most of the lecture, right? Um, that doesn't seem to matter. So um, our conclusion is that monumental buildings and investment were still important parts of the people of Rapa Nui's lives. Um, and, you know, we, we, were, we were discussing before the break as well about, you know, whether the Polynesians got there in the 1200s or people got there 2000 years ago. And I said, well, it's unlikely that people who got there only 800 years ago would have developed the society quite rapidly to start creating these monumental carved um, stone statues um, and so on and so on. And you don't just turn up on an island, start felling down the trees to build statues, right? There's more to life than that. So obviously I believe it, it's a society that's evolved. Um, and this, this, is, this is my thinking. We do actually have limited historical evidence um, from the West, and we actually have limited historical evidence from the Rapa Nuans themselves, because most of their text has not been transcribed, which is a shame, really, because that would be able to tell us everything about Rapa Nuan society from the level of what the Rapa Nuans felt about themselves. Um, once Europeans arrived on the island, there are many documented, uh, documented tragic events due to disease, murder, slave raiding, and other conflicts. Uh, so not only did the um, Western point of view um, change things, but also the Rapa Nuans had a different sense of who they were and a different sense of perspective. Now, going back to what I opened with at the beginning of the lecture, I wanted to sort of try and keep away from um, lots of those things that I had written down throughout the week, because lots of people have commented about Easter Island and, and, and everything that people were saying was, was, quite, was quite valid um, and quite interesting. But one of the key issues that I have been examining this week um, is away from, you know, who got there. Um, I have concentrated on just a few areas and one of those few areas um, is in regard to these wonderful statues that you have in front of us. Now, these carved statues are very near the, um, um, the place that um, is re properly referred to as the quarry. So what we need to do is just quickly show you that the Ranu Raraku quarry is believed that most of these heads, these bodies, um, were actually were actually taken from a quarry at Rano Raraku. But there's other evidence to say there's quarries on the island elsewhere as well. So back to this point. The point is, is that um, that's one that's actually laying flat. Uh, that one there, it's laying flat um, and there's others around as well. So the point being is that they would have been, um, they would have been carved out of the rock uh, horizontally, diagonally, maybe some vertically. Um, whichever way these were carved, uh, there is a, a point that at, at some point they were put directly um, vertically, like these ones in a completed form. We do know that um, they're carved on the front and there's intricate carves on the reverse. Now, the point that I've been seeing all week 
is is multifold. But up to half of all the statues carved on, on uh, Rapa Nui, Easter Island, are actually more or less within yards of the quarry. And you're thinking, why would a statue like this has been perfectly formed not move anywhere? Why didn't it go anywhere? And you start to think like a Westerner, surely this is like a production line and they would have been moved to this part of the island. But if you've got over a thousand statues on the island, some buried under five, six, seven meters of mud, um, you know, why weren't they moved? And I'm thinking like a Westerner, again, why weren't they moved? And then you start thinking, maybe the whole quest of quarrying these things, carving them, is part of the event. And then the other part of the event is actually to raise these things up. That's another event. And maybe that's the whole process. Why, why do we need to position these somewhere for them to be deemed as religious or um, ritual objects? They don't need to actually be cited anywhere. Now, there's a story that I've been banding on all week, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it as it is, because at this point I need this story before I go any further. I've said this before, but I'll say it in the right context. Um, one of my lecturers at University of Highlands and Islands, a chap by the name of Professor Colin Richards, who actually become the new professor of archeology span at the University of Highlands and Islands, I was there when he, he, he was one of my early uh, tutors, uh, when, when he turned up. In one of his lectures, he said about his visit to a Pacific island. And I said, that, I, that's a great story, been to a Pacific island. And he said he, he went there to study ethnogram ethnography. He, he went there to study how people relate to the history and archaeology, how it all works, right? Anyway, he woke up this one morning to a tap on his door. So he's got a tap on his door. Um, and he opens up and somebody says, there's something going on this afternoon. And he says, what? We're moving a stone. And he says, oh God, wow, we're moving a stone. How heavy is this stone? It's five tons. And he said, you what? You're moving a five ton stone? Yeah, we're moving a five ton stone by hand. And he gets really excited about this. Anyway, he, he knows he knows being involved in experiment archaeology, that moving a five ton stone needs to be done with pulleys, levers, wood, grease. It needs to be done by drilling a hole through a stone, dragging it along, and you need at least 15 to 20 archaeologists to move even a two or three ton stone, let alone five ton stone. My God, this is amazing. So anyway, he goes out and it's described more or less in the middle of the street, and there's a big group of people around. And this group, big group of people around, are around these two lads, um, about 16, 17 years old, around these two lads. There's a five ton boulder there, roughly hewn five ton boulder. And he's looking and he's thinking, wow. Now he's thinking like a Western and he's thinking, wow, I'm gonna see the stone move from here and it's gonna be put in a hole. Brilliant, that's how he's thinking, but anyway. Um, he's looking around and he's thinking, right, where's all those things that we used as experimental archeologists? Where's those pulleys? You know, where's the wood and all the rest of it? There's nothing. And these two lads, just two of them, start to move the stone. And he's told that the stone's gonna move over a mile. So, great. And, he's, and how is it done? It's done through seaweed and various oils that are put on the ground. And he's thinking, brilliant, so it's gonna move a mile. Hang on a minute. Two boys and 15, 20 archeologists couldn't move a two ton stone and they're moving a five ton stone. So Colin started thinking, you know, archeologists, we don't know anything. We absolutely don't know anything about moving things. We, we don't have a concept, but there's a problem with this whole thing. Anyway, part of the way on the journey, one of the boy's arms gets trapped under the stone because the stone's moving too fast and it fractures the stone. So he has to go to, it fractures the stone, fractures the arm. So the boy has to go to hospital. Um, anyway, the, the boy's arm's okay afterwards. It's fine because they got to it quick and, and, his, and his arm's fine. So there's one boy left. And Colin is thinking there's no way that this one boy can shift the remain this stone the remaining distance. And guess what? He did. Anyway, so eventually the stone gets to a position. So think of these statues as a position. Think of that one statue in front of you as a position. So they, they get this, this one stone to this position, yeah? And um, 
and he looks around and he thinks wicked and he looks around and no sooner has he been looking around everyone had buggered off including the lad and they were tapping him on the back and saying how wonderful he thought this is not right he went over to the stone and he was gutted because there was no stone there was no hole in the ground he was absolutely mortified anyway he thought oh that was an absolute waste of time but Actually, he was thinking like a Western archaeologist. Anyway, he went back to his apartment that night. Anyway, that, he, that, that night as well, he went to the taverna and he asked somebody in the taverna, he said, what an absolute waste of time that was. And everyone went quiet. And um, the local gentleman said, what do you mean it was a waste of time? And he said, well, why didn't he put it in a hole? Why didn't he erect the stone? And um, the individual turned around and said, well, you're thinking like a Westerner. We don't think like that. The, the process of moving the stone is actually the event. That is the whole point. That, that, that is the whole purpose of what we did today. And he said, I don't understand. But suddenly he did understand that archaeologists have been overcomplicating what, what all these things mean. We've been over, overcomplicating it. Let me give you another example, right? If, if you're not buying that, right? Let me give you another example. If you go to um, a stone circle, right, the outer stone circle has about um, 90 slots, right, over 90 odd slots. I, I, I remember the precise figure, but anyway, it was about around the out, whole outside, right, the outer stone circle um, inside the ditch, um, inside the ditch, really important, um, has 90 slots. And when archaeologists reconstructed it, they put a stone in each of these slots, you know, on the, on the, the, um, the diagrams as they're reconstructing it. And I say, the reason why there's not stones in, in about half of them is because they've been removed. Um, everyone believed it. There was originally stones in them. Anyway, archaeologists started excavating into some of these holes. Lo and behold, that hole showed signs that the stone had been removed. Partially, the top half had been cut off and the rest of the stone was in the ground. Brilliant. So that proves a point that this area where there's no stone standing, there's half a stone in the hole. So anyway, they went alongside another hole and there was no stone in it. And they thought, right, obviously the, the stone's been pulled out. And another archaeologist said, well, well, hang on a minute, right? If you put a stone in a hole, it's going to be really difficult taking that stone back out. Oh, no, it's not. So they, they excavated the bottom of that hole. There was no signs that a stone had ever been in that hole at all no signs at all so in other words those holes were left empty the 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 point of the point of, of the, that story is is that um the holes in the ground were meant to house a stone of say a community moving into the area and they never moved in but the practice of digging the hole is still there yeah so the the, the whole point of what i'm trying to say with these 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 statues is that they, all of them weren't meant to be moved. These are perfect. They're absolutely perfect. There's nothing wrong with them, but they were never moved. And half of these carved stones never left the quarry area because the whole purpose of the carving is the reason, in some cases, not all. And somebody said to me, maybe it's a bit of a rite of passage and we all went quiet today and we said, hang on a minute, is that the same rite of passage that we talk about when we look at the Birdman? And then we started to realise that maybe that's the case. You know, archaeology can be extremely complicated sometimes. Um, going back to this, the wrapping you in people following practices that proved, proved them great stability and success over hundreds of years, continued their traditions, in the face of tremendous odds. So in other words, people kept carving these statues, even though they don't have the same meaning that we interpret today. What we found is that once people started to build uh, monuments, um, they're saying shortly after the arrival of the island, I don't agree with that, but once they started building the statues, um, construct, carving the statues, moving them, putting them somewhere, whether they had this meaning or that meaning, right? And the other thing as well is, right, if you, in archaeology, we try to overcomplicate things, but then again, we like to oversimplify them. So in other words, what we're saying, right, 
that stone circle down the road is exactly the same meaning as that stone circle up there. And that stone circle has exactly the same meaning as that one. And that one's linked to Stonehenge, ley lines and all the bloody rest of it, right? Absolute, absolute crap. Because that stone circle has a different meaning from that stone circle, right? Well, one, 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 point, one point that I made on Monday, which I haven't made for the other lectures, I, I said, for example, right, if we, if we look at, um, if, if, we, if we want to look at, try and understand what's going on in Easter Island, we've got to look at other sites. So if you go to Britain, for example, you go to um, somewhere like, um, somewhere like Castle Rig, where Bill's been with me. Like when you go to Castle Rig, the stones at Castle Rig are really not, not very big things, right? Um, and if you cover them in soil, it wouldn't be much above the actual land surface that once existed because Castle Rig is in an upland area. That's a bad example. If you go to somewhere like um, Cornwall and Devon, right, they, they are now finding stone circles in upland areas. Um, and they're finding them because the soils are eroding away into the valleys. Now that's a clue. The stone circles were never meant to be seen. They, they were just covered up. So when you see examples like... Um, when you see examples like the Merry Maidens of Cornwall and you see examples at Avebury, always be suspicious of whether these stones were meant to be seen or not. The reverse is said, the complete reverse is said, when you look at the likes of Easter Island. The, the, the figures at Easter Island were meant to be seen and very much have got had an obsession with um, mud and trees within these lectures I've done this week. Now, we don't really know that um, what these figures have in front of us, the, the red scoria on the head, that, that, that sort of very soft uh, rock on the top, um, the red scoria itself, the top knots themselves. We don't know if all of those statues look like, we don't know if some of those are reconstructions. That's the problem. This is rather interesting to me, very much interesting. Now, if, um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna tempt fate. Here we go, touch the bottom of the table. If this lecture ends now because of technology, then fair enough, I need to get this across. Now, um, everything that I've said, I've, I've said two things. I've said, some, um, it used to be thought that the Western, Westerners, you know, the, the Dutch, the, the Spanish, um, after they started colonizing Easter Island, were using Easter Island from the fact that 1722, the Dutch named it um, Easter Island because of Easter Sunday, let's go into the modern period. Um, when they got there, it's very likely that that statue that you see in front of you at Ramu Raku, the quarry, was completely exposed. What am I talking about? How, how can it be completely exposed? Look, look at the amount of soil that's built up. If you think of this statue, that guy's, uh, that guy's a tall guy, two meters tall. Um, he's not, but, you know, gives it an idea. So it's two, four six, eight, and the other bit as well, a bit below, say it's 10 meters in height, right? Interesting thing. And you think, well, if this was all exposed um, at the point that um, Western has got there after 1770, where's all that soil come from? It's quite, the answer is quite stark. It is quite a simple answer. The Rapa Nguyen's didn't, didn't wipe out all the trees which I used to think, I used to think the Rapa Nguyen wiped out all the trees. Um, here and here and here and here, and probably going all the way down to here, there were still trees growing, really big trees, massive trees, huge trees. And then what simply happened was that when Westerners got there, they started felling what was left of the trees, meaning that all the soil itself was washed via landslides into the in around these statues, in around these statues here. Here we go. And some of these landslides were so great that um, those statues on the right hand side of the uh, image pushed them over. And we know that they're landslides. It's really important this, right? We know that they're landslides because if you look there, the sediment is slightly rocky. If you look there, the sediment's slightly different. And if you look there, the sed sediment's slightly different again. Now, if this had been natural erosion, over a period of time, there would be small thin layers. Um, and because the land tamed, it was still washing the valley around the, the statue, but it would be gradual. These were massive sudden events. 
and this whole statue would have been exposed. There's only one way this statue could have got here. It was walked there. It was walked there flat. It wasn't entered into a hole in the ground. It was walked there, right? The area around this statue immediately, there was without trees, but the rest of the landscape was with trees. This was positioned. This was exposed for everybody to see. And look at this as well. This is a really key point. Think, log think logically. The erosion top and the erosion at the bottom is very similar. It's quite eroded away. Actually. It's quite equal erosion all around the body. That tells us one thing, folks, that this landslips that are filled in around this body because of the removal of trees was done in more recent times than in ancient times, telling us that we were responsible for the removal of the remaining trees. It wasn't the Rapanuans, it was completely responsible for the annihilation of 95 to 99% of all the fauna and fauna that we blame for. It was actions that did it, the Westerners. And what, 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 what relevance has this got? What, why am I going on about this so much? The reason why this is so relevant is that when Westerners got there in the 1770s, they said that the local fuzzy wuzzies were wandering around naked and that they weren't capable of creating anything like this. As you get into the 1960s, you think about um, Von Daken and fire. And they basically said, right, we justify the enslavement of these people. We justify taking an um, island for ourselves. We justify taking its resources because these people are backwards. What they, what they are doing is they're blaming the locals for the destruction of the environment, when in fact most of the destruction of the environment was caused by those people justifying the slavery after the 1770s. And this is what's very important about this lecture today. It's again inventing, making history to justify, to justify the ills of the Western world. And uh, if anyone's thinking I've, I've swallowed the manual from Black Lives Matter, think again. I'm, all I'm doing is teaching real history and archaeology. Again, everything that I've just said, this is in this article. And you know what? It's so good when you read an article that's dated Monday, July the 20th. 27, 2020. Easter Island secret stone statues, hidden bodies. When I read this on Monday, I was on in heaven. Um, hidden bodies discovered by archaeologists. We've hardly excavated any of these complete bodies as they stand, um, removing the soil from around them. Um, so this offers us great new information. Known as the Maui uh, by the Rapa Nguyen people, these stone figures who created the figures in the tropical South Pacific. These stone figures, we do believe, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. There's one thing I agree with. They're being erected probably from the, um, probably from around uh, 1000 years AD to about, they were still believed to be, still being constructed in the 1700s. But away from those dates, the main period, the great phase of building are yeah, those dates in front of us, even though ones are going up before and after. Nearly half are still at Rana Raraku, the quarry. There you go, half. Um, thousands of them, thousands and thousands. Um, you know, when I mentioned, um, when I mentioned there's a thousand, somebody said, no, there's not, there's a lot more than that. And then I realized that uh, under those muds, there's more. In the sea, there's more. We have nicked the load as well, you know, all those things. Um, and what they are starting to do, th this, is, this is really interesting. The reason people think they're only ads is because 150 of these statues at the base of, of the volcano are hidden in all these muds and silts. Uh, this is how they're famously regarded. You got a wrong portrayal of what we've got at Rapa Nui. Some are looking inland and some are looking out to the sea. Some are looking at their ancestors out at sea. Some are looking at their ancestors inland, some are protecting the people inland, some bodies are buried around these statues, and then suddenly you realize that there's more than one reason why these statues are erected. So why not the ones in the quarry are just left, just abandoned? Do you know, do you know what? If you, if you want to talk about whether I'm right or wrong, 
listen to some archaeologists who say about um, this is an abandoned stone circle. They just started building it and they just abandoned it and decided to move somewhere else. Did they abandon it or was that, that actually what they were meant to be doing? Who's to say anything's right or wrong? Do you know what? When I was, um, one thing I learned, um, one thing I was learned when I was taking my little girl Carrie Ann to play group, right? I always used to, I always used to appear in, in little games and stuff. And then one of the women in the play group said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm playing with my daughter. And she said, no, you're not. Let your daughter learn. And I said, I don't understand. And she said, if, if that's a house to her, that's a house to her. But it's not to me. And she said, exactly. Allow her to make mistakes. Allow her to believe uh, what that Play-Doh snake um, looks like a snake to her. It doesn't mean to be a snake to you. And then I started to realize, actually, do you know what? I've been wrong. Whenever we look at archaeology, we always interpret it to our best, to our best way. Bill's been to Roman forts with me, right? But Bill knows full well that not all Roman forts are square or rectangular. I can give you examples of Roman forts that are not, are not square or rectangular. Yeah, all Roman towns are not square either. If you look at um, the likes of um, a Col if you look at the likes of Colchester, if you look at the likes of Verulanium, they're not all um, pocket form. They're not all the pocket diary form of archaeology. Unfortunately, we tried to put things into brackets and categories. Um, this is rather interesting, you know, a bit more about the erosion theory, a bit more about the trees, a bit more about all these other things. This is rather interesting. Uh, Jessica, are you still there? Yeah. <clears throat> now, here we go. I'm going to test you and embarrass you. I'm sorry. <laughs> we've got we've got carvings there, and the carvings start to fade, fade, fade further up. Okay, uh, the soil level is as indicated. All right. Um, what does that tell you? Um, to me, that I, I would suggest maybe is faded due to um, rain and other elements. Yeah, and the question I need to ask is, when were these carvings last exposed? Well, before, well, I'm not sure. Obviously, before just, it was all covered in soil. Yeah, that's it. That, that's the answer. And when, when could <laughs> this have been covered in soil? Um, when, well, when you said about the uh, whole of the Europeans coming over, taking the trees bingo. and the sort of the landslide. Bingo, bingo. That's it. That's that's more proof. That that is it. Uh, that that's that's quite comprehensive. That is quite a comprehensive description. So in other words, we've got a civilization that could have continued. Um, and you know, I I I have been wrong in the past myself. You know, I I I used to say that. Um, there's something really important what I'm just about to say. I used to say that the Eastern Islanders deliberately destroyed their environment to cut down all the trees to move the statues. Well, you don't need any trees to move the statues. You can walk them along with, with ropes and pulleys. I've got an illustration of that, right? So why do you need to remove all the trees anyway? There's no logic for it. Have, have Pacific Islanders removed all the trees from every island they've been to? The answer is no. Why are they going to do it on Easter Island? Why do you need to cut down all the trees? If you cut down all the trees, it uses energy, right? And you've got these beautiful resources of trees around anyway. They, they grow fruits, for example. Animals fly around in them. How could I be so stupid and dumb and thick to think that these people are going to destroy the, their own island? The only people that's destroyed their own island is people coming into it that don't understand what this island is about. Arrogant, ignorant foreigners. Now, what what I'd like to do now, I, I know, um, I know, you know, time wise today we'll probably go on until five. We we had a bit of an interruption. Um, Bill Bill's got to, um, I don't know, have a bath um, and all these other things. But we still got a few things to do, right? Have you had a bath today, Bill? No, 
I had one last month. Oh, well, shut up. Anyway, so uh, one, one, one thing that, um, one thing, uh, again, I'm going back to other lectures. I, I, I looked at plans like this and I thought there's, um, this is a little bit more comprehensive. Usually what you do see, um, you never see statues in the inland area, right? You don't see these. Because what they do to prove theory, what they say is that people um, only put statues along the coast. Fair enough, but that's not exactly true. There are statues inside the land as well. And then you start to think, you start to think, well, okay, um, statues are on why um, there's stations of areas those are like quarry quarry there and so on it's really difficult um, scientifically which quarry these statues came from because um, in a strat there's no st stratigraphy when you look at um, the tephra, when you look at the tooth, the, the soft tooth of rock, it's going to be the same all the way across the island. And then the question I was asked was that, um, did, did, what about these people? Did they actually um, have settlements on the top of the mountain and here and, and here? And did they have settlements here? And I say, I don't know. And actually, I do know because these people lived all over the island. Um, and you know, this is really important. When you go to Easter Island, it's dominated by just these statues along the coast. Uh, um, the island itself, uh, Rapa Nui, is a lot more than just statues. Um, can you see that one there? Somebody, somebody said to me, they said, um, what about, has there been any earthquakes in the, this period? And I said, of course there has. It's a, volcan it's, a, it's a volcanic zone, but it doesn't necessarily mean to have the... Um, the, um, the, the volcano is spouting off every five minutes, right? You don't need that. But what, 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 you, what you've actually got is that um, you're going to have, you can have um, um, seismic activity, but it's seemingly that none of the statues have gone over. If the statues go over, they, you know, it's gonna, they're going to be in bits. So whatever's happening with these statues, they, they've, they've lasted seismic activity. And somebody said, why, why do you... Have a look at that statue there. Why is it going that way? Well, it's going over that way because when it was put upright, like these, there was no soil behind it. But it can slip and it'll smash it up. Um, again, what I do now is go to coming coming close and close in it. Yeah. And go. At Arango, we've got evidence of a, a, a nice village, and this is really important. Um, there we go. We've got um, this crater here, uh, Rano Kia, um, and we've got this one, Mota Nui. So this one is called Rapa Nui, which means big wrapper. Um, and you've got um, Mota Nui. Um, you've got Mota Kau Kau, and you've got Mota Nui, which would be... Um, medium island um, or small island. So, so what we're going to do uh, is, is look at the, the Birdman Festival. So let's go directly into that. Um, so clear all that. So we know where we are. So when we look at the next image, we're looking at Mota Nui. Mota Nui, there we go. Um, now, that's that's a lot small, that well it's not massively small on the flat home, but it's not a big island so here we go here we go let's um let's let's go let's talk about this an annual chief or birdman was chosen each year at the ceremonial village of Arongo, which is just sort of over here um and the point is is that each of the each of the villages on the island of rapa nui and their chief would select um, one of their boys to represent them. So it was their champion, like knights in shining armor, the king has a knight, the lord has a birdman, job done. Yeah. 
Um, so they, they, they all went to, once, once a year, they all went to the dry stone cobbled houses that were perched high on the cliff between the Ranokaya crater and the ocean, which we've already shown, shown. Each of the candidates had a young man to represent him. Many didn't live. Every spring, these unfortunate young men had to make their way down the sheer cliff, 300 meters to the shore. So let's give you an idea of that. There's the crater. Hang on. There we go. They gotta go down these. That's 300 meters. So these lads are crawling 300 meters down to the base. Some would have jumped in. Many died. And then they would swim over a kilometer to this little island here. Our little island, Mota Nui. They would swim all the way out here. And they would be on a bunch of reeds through shark infested swells and strong currents to the largest and most uh, outermost islet, Mota Nui, where they waited, sometimes for weeks, the arrival of a migratory seabird, the sooty tern. And how do we know this? It's being written down by Christian missionaries in the 1840s. So this practice is still going on. There's no way this practice would still be going on if these people um, had, were, were backwards and um, if these people had destroyed their culture. This was, this was a practice that was still going on, but it was outlawed by Christian missionaries. The aim was to find his first egg, the sooty tern. The winner would swim back with the egg and then climb back up the cliff with the egg in their headband and his master now became the new sacred bird man. So in other words, uh, these people would have to get back with the first egg. Tell you what, if I was isolated on an island, I would kill everybody else and I would be the only person who would end up getting the egg. So job done, Bill. Isn't that a wise strategy? Yeah. Yes. Because it's said that lots of these Lots of these lads would fight over the egg. Um, so instead of fighting over the egg, if you kill everybody else, then you're the only one to get the egg. Arongo's rich rock art is festooned with carvings of the birdmen, which we show one or two images of that. Um, as, and sometimes it actually shows somebody holding the egg, which symbolized fertility. So this, this system eventually um, got to an end and that, that, that's that wonderful crater. Um, if, you, if you look there, that's actually the remains of these buildings. So we've actually, you see those little buildings there? I will show you an image of them. I've got one image towards the end. And again, when, when you think about, when you think about the, these people, it's a lot more complicated when you actually get into it. Yeah. Very complicated. That's known as um, El Gigante. Um, I, now, you know what I said earlier on? Some were carved horizontally, some were carved diagonally. That one's carved diagonally. And Bill, they did not use iron chisels simply because this is quite soft rock. So before you go off on one, Bill, no. This one's called El Gigante. They believe that this may have been up to 20 meters in height plus. And then you get the horizontal ones. And then you get, then you get me wanting to answer the following question. How do you get these out of the rock in the first place? Well, you don't. That's my answer, you don't. Um, I want to... Um, I want to sort of go back to what I've already said. Maybe the process of carving was the process, and that was why. But there's a bit of a problem taking this out of the rock. Not only have you got this overhang to contend with, can you imagine, right? There, somebody's then said, right, to get this out of the rock, you've got to remove this overhang. In doing so, removing this overhang would damage the statue. So again, I think the process of carving is actually the process. This was never meant to leave the rock. Ones that were hacked out of the rock, however, um, were then placed erect. And you would definitely need timber for that, or would you? 
could you do it with pulleys? Now, this is a rather interesting one. We know all, we know all of what I've said about the mud and the trees and the events and all the rest of it. Um, what happens after time is obviously if you leave these exposed, you lo use, lose all these angular um, natures of the carving, quite really fresh. And obviously these have been, these have been buried. And again, this is more evidence to say that they were still carving these up to the very point that Western has got there. Some say this is wrong. Reconstructing these is wrong. Putting them back up is wrong. Because one, maybe some of these uh, were deliberately taken down by the Rapa Nguyen's because they didn't feel they needed them. Maybe some were never erect in the first place and others were torn down by missionaries. Some of the beautiful rock art by Nia Arongo. And again, that's more of the statue that we saw earlier on. Somebody said to me, they said, well, um, Carl, what if you, um, what if you um, move these things on wooden rollers? I'm thinking, well, if you move these things on wooden rollers, not only may the wood be harder than the, the rock, um, as these roll along, um, you, you're simply going to lose the detail. Because if you're going to roll these along, right, the point is, this is, this is very close to the So let's look at this logically, right? If you're going to roll this along, right, why put the carvings on the side that you're going to roll? One, that doesn't make sense. Two, why erect these alongside the crater if they're meant to be moved somewhere else? So the only way of explaining that is they're going to be warped there, if they're going to be warped there in the first place. Now this is a symbol associated with the bird man. There he is, ready to jump into the water, to swim out to that wonderful island of Mata Nui. Um, and again, these people are beautiful carvers, and before you say it, Bill, this is about and we'll leave that there. Right, I don't know if any of you are followers of, um, of Sir David Attenborough. Well, I, I, I like his stuff, I really do. Well, mm. I love his stuff, I've been brought up with it. But years ago, about 20 years ago, I was watching television and he, he, was, sat in his, 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 um, he was sat in his lounge like I am and he was chatting away. And somebody said, they said, uh, David, what's your prized possession? And he said, look around, I've got loads of stuff, you know. Ah, there is one. And he brought out a figure that was similar to this. A figure very, very similar to this. And he said, this is from Easter Island, he said. Rapa Nui. And, the, 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 and he said to the commentator, he said, I then spent years researching this statue and then worked out that this was one of many figures that were taken from the um, island by the Americans in the late um, 1870s, 1880s. The Smithsonian has actually a full, um, if, you, if you've watched Night at the Museum, um, the Smithsonian has actually a, few, a, a full Easter Island figure, um, a stone one, but these little wooden figures have been moved all the way around the world. When he bought this at an auction, nobody wanted it, but this would be worth a fortune today. Um, these are actually obsidian um, flint um, axe heads. Um, if you look closely at that, that actually looks like Easter Island. And then somebody said, Carl, you're overdoing it. It may look like Easter Island, but these weren't deliberately made to look like Easter Island because they probably didn't know what Easter Island looked like. Yeah, fair enough. So by, you, by the time he gets to the 1800s, the, um, in the 1800s, they're, they're really portraying these people very backwards. Breasts hanging out. Oh, my God. A woman with breasts hanging out is a savage. To me, they're not, but that's, that's just between me and you guys. But anyway, um, the, they're showing these people as savages when, in fact, um, it's, it's what they wanted people to think. Oh, don't worry about these, you know, you're, you're okay to make them into slaves. It, it warrants, you know, if they wander around naked. Which woman wanders around naked? Now, we don't know. Um, you, you look on the internet and it, you look for, um, Bill, I made yeah. the age-old mistake. 
Bill, and you know what that mistake was, don't you? I, um, Say it again. <laughs> I made an age-old mistake, Bill. I typed into the internet um, looking for an Easter Island woman. You shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Um, okay, Michelle was coming, yeah, Michelle was coming in room that, and one, I was on an Easter Island dating website, and secondly, <laughs> um, I got onto a porn site as well, uh, and there were all these naked women in certain, and Michelle was not too happy, um, and Bill, I should have learned from that lecture that I did to the Lindy Valley History Society, shouldn't I have? You shut up, but you won't, you didn't. And, and you got your come up on, it's quite right too. Yeah, well, uh, um, yeah, this has happened many times, right? And um, I, I should stop. But I'm not sure what a native Easter Islander woman looks like because look at it, right? Go back to the beginning, Jessica, and ask me where these people came from. The answer is we can't know. One, um, the, gene the genetic type of people on Easter Island has changed quite a lot because as soon as they get contact with the, um, uh, with the Eastern and then the Western world, um, from the East, North America, South, North and South America, you've got um, um, Native Americans going over there. Um, you've got the Pacific Islanders going over there. You've got Spanish going over there. You've got so it's going to be particularly impossible now to get a pure Rapa Nuyen um, woman or man, as I've seen on these websites. Again, looking out at the sea, one, one of those lone figures. And look at that, Bill. Can I, can I tell you of another little thing I learned, right? Um, Jessica, you know if you ever do any work for archaeology company, don't yeah. Don't make this following mistake, right? Don't say to the children, right, what we're going to do, we're going to have a, a flat surface, right, and we're going to spread it out with seaweed and we're going to move that boulder. I was on our beach with a group of children. And I said, we're going to do this. Um, and uh, it started to move this stone and I nearly ended up losing one of the children to A and E as the stone Oof. nearly ran over their leg. At which point I stopped the exercise. I said, look, children, you know, the usual thing that you do with children, Jessica, look, children, it's all fine. Let's do something else. Knowing that you could have killed one of them. Yeah. <laughs> but this is rather interesting. So when you, um, when anyone ever says, look, they, they, they move them, they, they, they move the trees. They moved the trees because they needed to move the statues. But that means that the trees either side are going to be there and it's, it makes good sense. Because the other thing as well is if you move all the trees on both sides of the trackway where you're moving these statues, it's going to destable the ground because you've got roots, the root system of the trees either side, uh, keeping the soil together for these great things, big things to move. So this is what, this is how they're being moved. It's great. I love it. Um, don't don't give me that argument, Bill. That um, this is this is a stat this is a statue that's not as big as the others. It's the same principle. And the final thing I need to say today is. Oh, sorry, that's me. I'll just um, that that's uh, my acting image. Um, two <laughs> things I'd like to say is um, these are the buildings at Orongo. Um, they did have buildings. They did have stone buildings. And before you say it, Bill. That looks like a burial chamber on Orkney. Yeah, I see your point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But these were places that they lived. Thank you very much. And But Bill, you see the other point that archaeologists are still arguing um, whether things that are referred to as burial chambers um, weren't in fact used for something else beforehand. These are definitely houses and these are not burial chambers because they cremated their loved ones. <clears throat> the final point is that... Um, this is what um, um, Davy Attenborough found out. He, he, we're good mates, Davy. Um, um, so David Attenborough, he found out that lots of the carvings on wood were also being exported out of the country. 
and they also had a written language. It's had not been uh, properly transcribed yet. But when it is transcribed, Bill, no matter how many theories, no matter how many stories you can come up with, uh, these people will have written it down. This is the real history. And these people were in a historical age. Um, and you know what? At that note, even though I had a lot to talk about today, we've actually finished earlier this week. So, uh, Bill, anything you would like to say before we uh, finish this bit? Oh, thanks for volunteering, Bill. I know you're doing the lecture on, at the forum on Wednesday. Thank you very much, Bill. Thanks for that okay. topic. And thanks for volunteering, Pat, to chair. That's good. Um, anything you'd like to say, Bill? I was going to ask um, how much excavation has been done in the settlements where these people lived. But you showed me now the, the stone buildings still intact. Um, all the material they found, presumably, is in a museum somewhere? Ah, uh, right. It's, it's, in, it's in museums all the way around the world. Even the Pitt, um, even the Pitt Rivers Museum in, um, was it, in Oxford. It's all uh -huh. the way around the world. Uh, the British yeah. Museum has a good collection as well. Um, yeah. And I do believe that uh, the British Museum does actually have a Moa statue as well. Yeah. There has, there has to be something connected with um, religion. The fact that they've gone to this huge, uh, huge project of carving out all these different statues, weighing hundreds of tons and placing them where they have. It must have taken an enormous effort over many, many years. So it, it has some definite significance to them as regards uh, ritual and religion. It's a pity mm, we well, didn't actually, it, can, I, can I stop you, Bill, right? Can you can you stay? Can you stop with the words? It meant a lot to them, and just leave it there, because mm. um, our concept of religion is different from theirs, and their concept of meaning is different from theirs. If you stop with "it meant a lot to them," that's a good place to stop that statement. Yeah, of course, because we don't understand. Now, that? now that's another good word, <laughs> exactly. Mm. Well, but anything else you want to say, uh, Bill, before I ask um, Jessica? No, that's fine. Thank you, Carl. Okay, let, let, anything you'd like to say, Jessica? Um, obviously, obviously, you know, we're not going to know much because it's a different sort of society to us. Um, and you said, you know, some of them were facing inland and outland. And, you know, maybe it did have like some sort of protection to her. Maybe, you know, it was like their version of deities or something. We'll never know, but I think it's quite interesting. Yes, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful subject. We could have done a lot more today, but I just wanted mm. to do a concise overview. So um, what we're going to say is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let everybody talk now. Um, and let's um, let everybody on. Um, um, right. We've done Bodger Boy. We've done Babes. Let's do Henri. <laughs> I really enjoyed that, but it's a great shame, though, that most of the artefacts have been stripped away from the location and no one actually knows exactly where they came from on the island. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I completely agree. It's, it's, um, yeah, yeah it, it, it's, it's a tremendous shame that um, the context has been lost. And, and the, biggest, the biggest crime in archaeology is to um, reconstruct things in the way that the archaeologist thinks that they're reconstructed. Um, you know, for example, past reconstructions that I know of, if you go to the likes of Tinkinswood Burial Chamber, um, the archaeologist Jay Ward knew about wrongful reconstruction. So the areas that he reconstructed were using the herringbone chevron, and the original stuff uh, was the flat stuff, because he didn't really know whether his reconstruction was right or not. Um, so that's good reconstruction. Um, I've been to um, a Roman fort in Cumbria called Hard Knot Fort. The archaeologists reconstructing the Hard Knot Fort didn't immediately rebuild the fort. Basically, there's a thick back black layer of the actual Roman and the non-Roman above where the reconstruction is because he wasn't sure. If you look at a Cardiff castle, William Burgess in the um, late 1870s, 1880s, when he was rebuilding the wall around Cardiff Castle, 
uh, instead of instead of saying what we'll do is uh, we'll do a limestone complete limestone rebuild nobody's going to know the difference between roman and modern uh, you've got the roman limestone and then you've got the red rad the sandstone above it and then he's done the reconstruction above it mm. now, I, I think the wall of cardiff castle is a bit taller than it should be right but then again william burgess is not saying that that's the roman reconstruction he's just saying this is the roman stuff and you can make up your mind that's what they should be doing on easter island and actually this is what the rapper new Inns are saying they're saying hang on a minute right this is our bloody island right this is our culture we believe that you should leave everything as it is you've done enough damage and this is exactly what the australians are saying now the aboriginals the aboriginals are saying they're saying um it's our culture right you come out here and you dare to say that we're making our history up you dare to say that our dream space is wrong you dare to say you dare to say that our creation theory is wrong right if you want to really understand our culture, you take everything that we're telling you as fact, and then you can understand. And the only way of understanding Rapa Nui is by having all those aspects together. Um, and, and actually, I go, I go with the Rapa Nui in story. We, we destroyed the island and um, not them. And what, mm. what are we to, what are we, how can we judge these people? We can't, um, you can't judge these people. Um, anything you'd like to say, Pat? I really enjoyed it. I thought, oh, I want to go there, but then I can go to all these museums, you know, and see all the things there. I have seen one of the statues, I think it was in London, but um, I'd like to... That's got to be the one in the British Museum, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'd exactly. like to look closer at the smaller items. Yes, exactly. And what about you, Annie Panny? Oh, I I was just listening to what you were saying and I was trying to imagine, you know, being one of those ratatouilles and going to the island. It's so remote. It's such a remote island. What would I do with just a few people? I, I think I think the feel the feeling I got is that they were some like protection, you know. They mm. they made them and and you know, they thought maybe people would be frightened of coming on to the island, you know, and I don't know, just... Well, mm. actually, actually do, you know, do you know the one thing I'm going to say is that um, everything that you can say is probably what happened. Mm. Because remember, this is a period of of hundreds of years that these statues are being used for. And Anne, you can't tell me why Stonehenge was constructed. No. You can't tell me that no. the first day that somebody s sat and planned Stonehenge, that that would be the same plan for a thousand years. The mm. reason why Stonehenge was built was for a hundred different reasons. The mm. reason why those st statues were constructed was for dozens of different reasons. And in mm. fact, not just one interpretation is right. Mm. Lots of these interpretations are mm. right. And also there are different people carving those statues at the island for different purposes. Mm. So you could be right. I could be right. In fact, we could all be right. And there's no reason why we can be wrong. And that's very important. So um, if that's everything yeah. everybody would like to say today, um, if that's everything from you, Anne, then I'm going to say we'll be doing the Nabataeans um, next week. And, um, the Nabataeans, Petra, the cisterns, the, the loss of the buildings, and all the rest of it, sand, I, that, I'm looking forward to doing that. Obviously, we've got the lecture on Saturday. Ghost, um, a ghost walk does return um, in August. And um, see those next Wednesday. And, um, and obviously, I need, I need sort of personal details to sort of be able to um, deal with um, of situations if you can get them to me anything will be kept in confidence and i'll probably put that in an envelope put that in my bag and we'll leave it there yep. hopefully i'll never need it but i don't want the same thing as dennis happened to happen again if anyone wanted a little chat afterwards then it's very, then a very welcome and if anybody's got anything else to say then say it now uh, but if not um thank you for joining us today uh bill uh, have you all enjoyed it today Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. Thank you. I did Thank understand you. it. I did understand where it was in history now, and you know mm. where it was. 
I understood it more. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That, that, that's what, you, we, 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 we achieve something. That's good. So, um, so I'm going to say if, if you're all going, if anyone wants to stay and chat, then it's fine. If not, um, I'm going to say good guy, good, good guy, good guy, goodbye to Bill <laughs> and um, Pat, um, Henri, um, <laughs> and I will hover. Oh. Thanks, folks. Thank you very much. And all, Thanks for joining us. All stay safe. <laughs> Yes, stay safe. Please, please stay safe. Yeah, that, that would be um, very, very useful. Um, Carl? Yep. Hang um, on a minute. I'm just pointing something down a minute. Hang on a minute. Yeah, um, no, that's fine. You stay there. Um, we got, I, yeah, we've got... Uh, there, were, there were seven of us today, wasn't there? Yeah. And uh, Pat and... Uh, yes, yeah, okay. And there was me... Uh, was there six or seven? How many of us were I think there? There, I think there were six, but seven counting your other screen. Oh, yeah, that's, that's Dave. That's Dave. <laughs> um, there's the other screen now. There I am. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I, get a, I'm, I don't want to remove him yet. Right. Uh, right. So, who wants to talk to me first? Oh. Yeah, if you go, I, I mean, I, I, I've got to go really. But uh, I, is there anything you want to say? Is there anything we've got to do for uh, uh, Dennis? Is no, I, I think, I think, I think personally, I, I, I think personally now um, we'll just let that. I, I, Archaeology Camry's done its best. We yeah. need to let the family now now do the morning, and we need to let them get on with it. And um, okay. We've done everything that we can do, and yeah. um, I think, I think um, we've done everything Dennis would expect of us, and I think we'll leave it there. Yes. Okay. Then. Right. I agree. I agree. Anyway, with that. take care, Anne. Okay. Take bye care. Then. Bye bye. What What about you, Pat? Have you got anything um, um, to say? You have to see this. Um, uh, remember that first picture you showed us, the very first one. What was oh, that yeah. all about? What yeah, was that yeah. about? Ah, what's all that about? Yeah, um, it's, it's, believed, it's believed to be a little cottage. Oh, what about the round stone in the middle? <laughs> um, a, a grinding stone or something. I'm told, I'm told oh. it's associated with some kind of um, a house. But then again, yeah. I'm getting that second hand. So yeah, um, yeah. it's down to interpretation. It yeah. was interesting though. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much, Pat. Okay. Bye. Oh, no, and, uh, Jesse, I hope your babies. I hope your. Dog yeah, no, I'm more. fine. It yeah. was just uh, my mum. She got a little bit upset yeah. over it. What kind of dog was it? Um, it's a Chihuahua. She's by you. Oh. Uh, sleep oh. So oh, she's a Chihuahua. Oh. She's a little baby. I got a board of oh. oh, she's but... already. Oh. Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> Oh bless oh, her. She's all tired, Lush. She's hiding her face. Yeah. Oh, oh <laughs> lovely. Thank you. Showing uh, it. See you. See you next week then. You okay. next week. Bye bye. 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 Um, Carl, um, I'm gonna send you my article tonight, but I also um went on a little trip yesterday. With sort of. Uh... Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. It, that was a bit weird then because people <laughs> were still talking as they left. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I've got the article ready um, now to send off to you after we finished. Um, I also went on a little trip yesterday that involved some history. So do you want me to send that over to you as well as like a little tiny article? If, you, if you've got a few photographs, that'd be great. Yes. Yeah, and I, got, I got photos as well. Good. Right. Okay, that's cool. I was just double checking with you. Oh, all right, then. No, that's great. Anything, we'll put that in the next newsletter and we'll... Um... Um, yeah, if you join us tomorrow on YouTube, that'd be great. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Tra, Carl, keep, take care of yourself and keep safe. Uh, I, I, I will. I'm gonna. Um, yes, I, I, I've got that tomorrow. I'm gonna. I'm gonna take tomorrow morning off. Yeah, um, have a nice rest. Yeah, I will. Okay, I will. Yeah. Bye. Take care. Thanks for all that. See you tomorrow on YouTube. Bye. 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 -bye. Bye, -bye.